Today's lecture is a two-parter, and I'm splitting it into two pieces, so you're going to find two separate files, two separate YouTube videos. So this first part is more on sex, so please look at lecture 17 to see the first part for sex. And uh, so we're going to finish up talking about sex and the brain today, so, and then we will, the second part of lecture 18 will be on the hippocampus and memory. So why don't we get talking more about sex? So I'm showing this diagram because this is a, a, another really nice illustration of how SRY works to lead to the production of testes or not. And it's going to show like the um, different steps in which we get from gametic sex or chromosomal sex. Typically females are XX chromosome arrangement, males are XY chromosome arrangement. The SRY gene is found on the Y chromosome, so females do not have an SRY. And that means the bipotential gonads turn into ovaries, which ends up producing female hormones, estrogen and progesterone, which acts on the uh, leading to a feminized brain, right? Um, and inducing certain changes within the feminized brain as an adult, leading to female typical behavior, a lot of activational changes. So the default setting for a human, it, with, especially without an SRY, is to turn into a female right? No SRY, you're going to have a female, you don't need the hormones early on, it doesn't happen neonatally, and you end up with a female feminized brain, and when hormones are present in the adults, you get female typical behavior, the activational side. So the organization happens on its own without hormones, and then you have the female ending uh, as a result. For the males, we have a Y chromosome that has an SRY, which induces genes that um, suppress ovary genes and add uh, and turn on genes that promote testes development, turning the bipotential gonad into a testis. That leads to production of testosterone very early on. Testosterone can be aromatized into estrogen in certain places. This masculinizes the brain, leading to the adult to have male typical behavior, especially in the presence of testosterone, but even estrogen in the brain plays some role in that. So this is just a, a really nice diagram summary of that uh, uh, the whole thing that's, that we discussed in the previous lecture. Here's another nice summary of this, um, but showing a little bit more of how we think about how it acts within the brain. So testosterone organizes the, br the brain, the developing brain, to be more male-like. So testes very early on in utero are producing a lot of testosterone circulates around the body and acts on the brain. But in the brain, it's off, It's more typically the case, not exclusively, there's a little bit acting on androgen receptor, but a lot of places where aromatase, the, the, uh, the enzyme aromatase converts it into estrogen, and then that acts on an estrogen receptors to masculinize the brain, leading to male typical behavior. That's what happens in utero. This also works uh, as an, in adults too. Um, for females, this process is happening. The testosterone being converted to estrogen happens within the ovary. It's aromatase working there. And there's only estrogen that gets released and progesterone. So these hormones then circulate around the body and act on the female brain to produce female typical behavior. But this is only what happens in adults, right? So this happens twice in males. It happens during development and during uh, post-puberty in adulthood. This process happens in uh, only in adult females. It does not happen in utero, right? Because the, the without in the absence of any steroid hormones, the fe the 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 brain will turn into a female-like brain. But in the presence of testosterone and or estrogen, you end up with a male brain during development. So um, of, of course, one ultimate result of this is that there is uh, reproduction. That's one of the reasons why we have to have male and female brains to begin with. Um, so we're gonna talk just briefly about the neural control of male and female reproductive organs. It's a super interesting process. And since that these are organs that are down below, um, it involves uh, circuits that we have already kind of learned about in the spinal cord. So we're gonna discuss the relationship of the reproductive organs to the spinal cord. You will see on the right, 
Um, a pretty complex set of pathways, but you know, this is the female here, pretty obvious. Here's the male down here, also obvious. And pay attention to these pathways, and you will recognize these names. We have sensory pathways in green. We have parasympathetic pathways and sympathetic pathways. So reproduction involves the activation and involvement of the autonomic nervous system. So we're going to talk a little bit about that. There are four stages to reproduction in animals, including humans. The first is the stimulation of mechanoreceptors that induces engorgement of external genitalia. So this is controlled by the parasympathetic nervous system. So within the female reproductive system, we have significant sensory um, innervation, mechanoreceptors located throughout the, the, the female genitalia, particularly within the clitoris. And of course, in males, they have mechanoreceptors located across the penis, uh, in particular um, in the glands of the penis, right towards the, the tip. Stimulation of these things induces engorgement. So you can see that when we have the stimulation, the mechanosensation happening um, within the spinal cord, it induces activation of parasympathetic pathways. So these parasympathetic pathways act on the uh, tissues there to um, allow for greater blood flow into these areas and they become engorged. The penis becomes erect, the labia in females becomes swollen. The next stage in reproduction is plateau. This is when we have further engorgement and release of lubricating fluids from the woman's vaginal wall and from the man's bubble urethral gland. So this is the bubble urethral gland. The, the male reproductive system has all kinds of little glands. And as we've learned, glands are heavily regulated by parasympathetic and sympathetic nuclei, uh, areas of the, of the spinal cord. And so, um, yeah, the next stage is that we have in, increasing engorgement and uh, release of lubricating fluids. The third stage is orgasm. So arousal, plateau, then orgasm. So orgasm, interestingly, involves activation of the sympathetic nervous system, the fight or flight response. Apparently this is another F, fornication. So orgasm involves the uh, activation of the sympathetic nervous system. And um, in men, this triggers muscles in uh, to, uh, deep inside the body to push sperm through the vas deferens and out the penis. So that's ejaculation, um, and that's the sympathetic nervous system that does this. So it's activating these uh, a series of muscles along here, pushing sperm out. In females, we know that there's activation that occurs. Um, there's all kinds of changes that happen within the cervix, um, that the cervix also does this sort of pulsing response, uh, but there's less known about this process in women. The last step is resolution. This is the final end of it. When once orgasm has occurred, the genitals have to drain of blood. Um, engorgement decreases. Everything becomes flaccid, is the word. And some time must pass before orgasm can be initiated again. So you can't stimulate orgasm to occur again. There's this um, rest period that occurs. So that is the four stages, um, and you can see that it involves names of things that we have already talked about. All right, so the other thing that I wanted to touch on briefly um, and probably could have included in the previous lecture, but um, I wanna talk about the role of some of these sexually different brain areas and, and how, they, um, how we know that they're involved with certain processes. So of course, one of the basic techniques that we know in neuroscience that shows whether a, new, um, a brain area is important for a function or not is to lesion it and then see what happens to behavior. So this is a famous experiment done quite some time ago now where they lesioned the SDNPOA. So this was done in male rats and these lesions are very hard. The SDNPOA, as you probably have seen in the images that I've shown, it's pretty small. 
and there's variation in how much of the SDNPOA gets destroyed in these lesions. And so in this study, they, cat they categorized the SDNPOA destroyed as greater than 50% or less than 50%. So this, they would have to lesion them, test them behaviorally, kill the animals, slice the brains, and then look to see how much of the SDNPOA was damaged or not. And they had three groups. So they had uh, more than 50%, less than 50%, and then controls. So they did the surgery, they let the animals recover, and then they presented them with willing females. They observed a series of sexual behaviors from the males, and the lesions, the lesion males showed lower frequency of sexual behaviors. So there's a bunch of different sexual behaviors they measure in this study. I'm just showing one of them, which is the median amount of time it took before ejaculation occurred in 30 minutes, which is uh, equal to 100, uh, 1,800 seconds. Um, so they present them with a female and they look to see whether they ejaculate or not. And the median value for the lesion group was 1,800 seconds, which means ejaculation did not occur in any of the animals that they looked at. Um, I think in one of the groups, the less than 50% group, there was one animal that had ejaculated, but the median, so that's the 50% mark. So if they had 10 animals and and six of the 10 were uh, showed no ejaculation whatsoever, then the median is going to be the full 30 minutes, nothing at all. Um, yeah, so um, it's, it's clear that lesioning these, this little tiny brain area has a, a significant impact on these animals to have normal sexual function. Over the next couple of slides, I'm going to tell you about a really interesting species uh, that reveals an awful lot about how the HPG axis can modify and change and have a huge impact on behavior. All vertebrates, to some degree, have reproductive behaviors, some of which is quite elaborate in some species, many species, in fact. Um, and one that's been uh, quite well studied is the African cichlid fish, Estatotilapia bertoni. So this fish has this very interesting overall social structure. When you look at just the males, if you assess them in any given population, somewhere between 70 and 90% of males will look like this. These are referred to as subordinate males. They look very, very similar to females, in fact. You can see they're sort of bright, they're, they're kind of white in color, but um, um, pretty nondescript. They have very simple behaviors. They do a lot of schooling and fleeing. They run away from um, attacks. They are non-territorial and they are faded and they have no eye bar. A dominant male, this is the same species, this makes up 10 to 30% of males. They show complex dominant behaviors. They are very territorial and they have bright coloration and eye bars. So you can see there's this really interesting split that happens within these species. But the amazing thing about this is that they're not fixed. They can actually go between one and the other. So this uh, is a video of what this looks like. Um, I'm gonna have a link to the video right here. So I'd like you to watch that now and then come back and, and then watch this. Um, the rest of the, the presentation. Okay, so if you're watching this on YouTube, link here. Um, there's a link in the video description, or you can watch this through the PowerPoint. But let's walk through what happens there. So here you see that in fact that these species they're not fixed. The male, the dominant male, will have a, a harem of females. So he's got his his sweet crib here, um, and uh, and he's got all these females that he's hanging with. Um, they will fight with other males in order to determine who's going to be dominant or subordinate for the other, for, uh, and who's going to have the crib. This can be replicated in the lab. Okay, so people who study this in labs, and there are quite a few labs who, are, in fact, study the, this this particular species. What they do is that they have a tank with only one um, nesting site, which is usually just a tube where these guys can hang out. And the females like that. They want to be near the tube so they can lay their eggs. And the male will protect the site and defend um, the females from being um, uh, bred by 
subordinate males. And, um, and he, you know, you can see this male is really brightly colored. It's got the bright eye bar, and he would be fighting off these subordinates. Um, so one way to test for status ascension in these species is to, at night, go in with night vision goggles. So it's completely black in the, in the laboratory area. Uh, a student or you know researcher will go in with night vision goggles and will take out the dominant male at night. So no one can see what's going on. It's completely black, uh, but the male is gone, right? So the next day, what happens, it's now daytime, and the subordinate male se sees that the dominant is gone. Whoa, cool. He's got a nesting site. He's got these, these hot ch chica females right here. And he wants to get in here and take over the nesting site. So what will happen is he'll swim over to this site and he'll start displaying dominant behaviors. And he'll turn his colors on almost instantaneously, within a couple of minutes. He will go from this, this pale light color to bright colored, a bright, um, a very dominant uh, sharp eye bar. And he'll start showing dominant behaviors and uh, defending his females from um, a potential rival males. So you can observe all these changes happening. And so here's some data just kind of showing what this looks like. This is this is data showing just four individual males, and they monitored these males over a period of five minutes, uh, in periods of five minutes up to about 30 to 35 minutes. And they were looking at the ascending males. So they looked in the previous day when there was still a dominant male present, and this ascending male, as soon as lights went on, the ascending male showed very few aggressive dominance-like behaviors, right? Hardly any. None of these males were showing any of them. On um, the next day, when they did that experiment and they pulled the, the dominant male out, now it's an ascending male. You can see all the males start showing dominant-like behaviors very quickly. So this is the number of behaviors per minute, six per minute, eight per minute, 10 per minute. Um, they're really showing a lot of dominant behaviors all within that first 30 minutes. So what's going on here? Clearly something is happening in the brain and that there's something going on here. So let's take a look. Now, one thing that's interesting is that GNRH levels increase in these animals. Um, this end, of course ends up leading to an increase in LH and FSH production. And, and then that ultimately leads into an increase in circulating engine. So within 30 minutes, so what, what, what's happened here is that um, in this study, this, these are studies that came out of Russ Fernald's lab, who's at Stanford. Um, they did the experiment where they killed animals 30 minutes after lights on. They had a subordinate animal. They had an animal that was ascending for 30 minutes. And then they had animals that were dominant. So they had been dominant for some time. And they looked at me and then they just measured the levels of GnRH, and they can see that within 30 minutes, the expression of GnRH was all already significantly higher than subordinate, but still not quite as high as dominant. So they're having the surge in GnRH that's happening in the brain, right? So GnRH is being turned on. This is leading to uh, ultimately an increase in the size of these neurons. So 24 hours later, and 120 hours later, you can see within just 24 hours, these neurons are actually getting much bigger and they're looking much more male-like than they are, or dominant-like than they are in the subordinates. So um, so that you can see they're actually getting quite a bit bigger. And of course, when you have this increase that happens in GNRH, this leads to an increase in LH and FSH. So within 30 minutes, you can see um, LH and FSH are, are going up quite a bit. In fact, almost as high as a dominant, uh, um, almost right away. So there's like this quick surge that happens and it goes down a little bit because of some negative feedback that happens. But then it eventually gets up to the point where now LH and FSH are super high. So what's happened here is that by going from subordinate to dominant, this is a little bit like when, say, you were uh, away from your house, uh, you went on vacation and your furnace was turned down, right? So you turned it down to 50 degrees. That's the subordinate situation. Your, your furnace is still going to turn on, but it's not going to turn on that often. And everything is going to be kind of cool in the house. But as soon as you get home, you crank the, the furnace. You know, it's cold in the apartment. You're like, oh, geez, it's all cold. Turn on the furnace. All of a sudden, you have a new baseline. And now you want the things to be hot. This is a bit like how the subordinates turn into dominance. Their baseline all of a sudden goes way, way up. And now 
um, they can, t the, there's stimulation that's happening where like the furnace has been turned on, the temperature has been turned up and they want a lot more LH and FSH, just like you, you would want a lot more heat being produced in the house. And so of course, LH and FSH acts on the testes and leading to production of testosterone. So LH and FSH also stimulates the reproductive system. And that's shown here. So with all that LH and FSH, it acts on the gonads and within 24 hours, so you can see um, this is ascending and you can, this is a picture of what these testes look like. So they have these kind of long testes, which is kind of weird, but they're fish. You can see that they had bigger testes within 24 hours. They also have increased more motile sperm um, their spermatogenesis and sperm velocity doesn't really change all much, but the gonadal somatic index, so the sizes of the, of the testes gets much, much bigger. So when they ascend to dominance, this is part of it. So I'm going to tell you a little bit about um, something kind of similar about the relationship of testosterone and dominance or aggressive behavior. But this is a story in humans. So this is a very famous study. This isn't the only study that's been done in humans um, related to testosterone, testosterone and aggression, but it's, it's kind of an interesting story. So we're gonna walk through it a little bit. So this was a study that was done at the University of Michigan uh, with undergraduates. And University of Michigan, it's a popular university. It gets students from all over the country. And they looked at where these students had come from across the US. Okay, so they're recruiting students that were from outside of Michigan. And they had students from uh, a bunch of different areas. They had to find students whether they were in the South, had they lived in the South or not. Um, so the South was divide, defined as census divisions five, six, and seven. What this means is that this included the states of Delaware, Maryland, West Virginia, Virginia, North Carolina, South Carolina, Georgia, Florida, Kentucky, Tennessee, Alabama, Mississippi, Arkansas, Oklahoma, Louisiana, and Texas. Now there's an interesting wrinkle to this. I, the reason why I'm going through the details is because this is Virginia Tech. We have a lot of students that are from Northern Virginia, but of course we have students from all across Virginia. And so there's a distinction that the authors had made in the paper specifically about Virginia. So in this experiment, they found students that were from Washington DC and from towns that they could identify as the immediate suburbs, they were excluded because Washington DC or Northern Virginia is probably not representative of either Northern or Southern culture. All of the other students that were in the study were considered Northern. Okay, so there's that interesting distinction. I'll let you guys take of it what you will. All right, so that's how they divided the students. They figured out whether they're Southern, quote unquote, or not. Then what they did is they, did, um, they, they brought them into the lab and they told them that they were going to be doing a certain kind of experiment. Um, they were put into a waiting room and then they were told that they needed to walk from the waiting room to the, to the room where they needed to do the experiment. When they were in the waiting room, they had a cheek swab that was done so that they could measure, they can get a measure of their level of, of, of cortisol, as well as a measure of their testosterone. You can actually measure both of those things from just saliva. They waited there for like 10 minutes and then they had the students come go walking through a hallway down to where they were told they were going to be taking a test. In the hallway, what these researchers had done, they had set up a file cabinet to be in the hallway and they had a student actor who was messing with the file cabinet and was trying to, you know, working with the file cabinet, taking some files out, but was going to be in the way of this student. And, um, uh, and, and was gonna, you know, sort of get in the way of this student and have this bad interaction. One thing that the, the actor had to say to the student was to call him an asshole. So that was part of it. <laughs> so he's going to say, hey, asshole. Uh, remember, this is all, I, I should have mentioned this, this is all males, okay? So this, there are no females in this study, it's all males, including the actor. So there's this interaction that happens in the hallway. Then the undergraduate is supposed to continue on to the testing room. But in fact, what happens in the testing room is that they take, then take another cheek swab. So the student was unaware that he was actually being tested in the hallway. So, um, so, and that's the study, right? So they have a bad interaction and then they look to just see what their, per their perception of, of things were. 
Um, I want to point out the title of this study. It's called Insult, Aggression, and Southern Culture of Honor, an Experimental Ethnography. Okay. So um, there's some several data tables from this study. Um, here's table one. I just want to show you this. So this is the observer's ratings of Northern versus Southern participants' reaction to insult. So about the culture of Southern valor and honor. So for these participants, the percent of anger ratings as high or higher than amusement ratings. So the Northern participants, about 35% of them, um, they had anger ratings that were higher than their being amused by this stupid actor who called them an asshole. But for the Southern males, 85% of them were anger, more angry than they were amused. And, and so you can see what the amusement ratings look like for the Northerners and, and for the Southerners. So Northerners were more likely to just be amused by the whole situation, um, but not exclusively. And But Southern men were more likely to be angry. Okay, that's the result from the study. Take with it what you will. So what did they do with this saliva to measure out testosterone? So the cool thing is that they had two measurements per person. So they had a control and then they had the insult. And they can measure the change in testosterone levels as a percent, okay? So they have the controls here. And you can see that um, for the northern subjects, there was an increase, but a relatively small increase post-insult. For the southern subjects, there was a significant increase in testosterone levels within just the 10 to 15 minutes that occur between the first sample and the second sample and being told that you're an asshole. So this surge of what's happening in the brain for having a GnRH response, the thing can be turned on in an aggressive situation and it can lead to having a perception of, hey, I am actually angry, I'm ready to fight perhaps. Um, testosterone is one thing that mediates this. It is part of the aggression pathway in a lot of different animals, not just in the African cichlid fish, but also it appears in humans. So that's it for this portion. Um, here's some key questions about sex and steroids in the brain. There's some repeats in here because there's certain things that I've touched on more than once from the previous lecture. Uh, one is Number one is not a repeat. What are the four major stages of sex and what parts of the nervous system control those stages? What are some of the ways that the HPG axis can change over the course of an adult human or adult animal lifespan? So now that I've given you some additional um, experiments to, to, to think about, you know, we've got the, um, the African cichlid fish and the changes that occur there with the furnace being up or down. Same goes for humans, right? Even in an aggressive circumstance. And then how do androgens relate to aggressive behavior in animals and humans? Some of these things are connected. So over the course, um, so when I'm talking about an adult human or adult animal lifespan, what I mean is like, all right, the, the entire lifespan from conception, right? The fertilization occur. What happens in utero? What happens during juvenilehood? What can happen in adulthood? Think about how that furnace gets turned off and on and then back on again, uh, off and on and off and on, early, or early on in development and then even later on. That's it. So uh, stay tuned for the second part to lecture 18, which is going to be the hippocampus.